This is a serious message to everyone watching my production right now. Peace and love, peace and love. I want to tell you that the 2020s is the opposite of the 1960s. Starting with number one, a youth surplus versus an elder surplus. It kind of goes without saying that World War II wasn't exactly an ideal time to start a family. Many men were of course conscripted in completely foreign lands, and were thus separated from the women who were staying back home, often working in the factories. And even if you were one of the lucky couples fortunate enough to escape such a fate, the prospect of having your nation be taken over by a rival power nevertheless made the short-term prospect of having offspring to be seen as a relatively unwise one. But after World War II had concluded, so too had such conditions, with men and women once again being reunited under peace, and as such, many people who would have otherwise started families during the war now started to make up for lost time, resulting in a massive baby boom and the subsequent creation of the unusually large generation known as the Baby Boomers. If we take a look at the population pyramid of the United States in 1950, you'll see that men and women in the 60 to 64 age bracket made up a total of around 4% of the national population. Whereas boys and girls aged 0 to 4 made up a staggering combined 10.8%, which is almost three times more. America, and the wider Western world during this time, had a massive youth surplus, and the 1960s was obviously a noteworthy decade in this regard, because it was during this time that many such boomers would start to enter adulthood, and thus have somewhat of a say in society. Being the largest generation, combined with the experimental, risky nature of youth, created the unusual conditions whereby they had a much more impactful cultural influence than any youth that came before them. The Beatles, for example, all reached their heights of international stardom during their 20s, and the band would break up before any of its members even hit their 30s. And while the Beatles as people were technically not boomers themselves, they were nevertheless adored by them, setting a new standard that the elderly generations of the time utterly rejected. This was a new age, with a new generation, that developed its own unique tastes in pretty much everything. Out with the old and in with the new was the mantra of the time, and they let themselves be known very quickly. Logic that would especially hold true in politics, whereby a youthful subculture slowly started to bubble, inevitably going on to succeed what came before them. But fast forward to the 2020s, and this couldn't be any more different. Going back to the population pyramid, whereas in 1950 it looked like this, 70 years later in 2020, it would look like this. Whereas those aged 60 to 64 once made up 4% of the population, they now made up 6.3%. And whereas those aged 0 to 4 once made up 10.8%, they now made up 5.8%. No longer is there a youth surplus, but on the contrary, an elder surplus. And there are numerous reasons debated as to why this is now the case. Longer life expectancy for the elderly, selfish individualism via feminism, economic struggles making families almost impossible, or perhaps a combination of the three. But nevertheless, regardless of the cause, the overall result of such is very clear. Whereas the youth of the 1960s were loud and heard, the youth of the 2020s are quite the opposite, quiet and forgotten. Almost every issue that young people, left or right, universally seem to care about, such as affordable housing, free education, and job availability, are constantly never addressed. Because why would they be? The vast majority of Western governments are now made up of incredibly elderly people, in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s, of which such issues are the least of their concern. And as such, Western policy now almost totally revolves around the desires of what such elderly people desire, leaving their mathematically outnumbered and extremely demoralised youth to rot in poor, selfish decision-making. It feels like the only Zoomers who actually have a voice in society thus far don't even promote a coherent original worldview that actually benefits them, 
at all, but are instead useful idiots, merely having their beliefs puppeteered to them by their elders, such as the forced obsession with climate change. Something that role plays as a rebellious grassroots youth movement, but is, in reality, well established and backed by numerous multinational organisations. Even culturally, the Zoomers are almost completely void of a tangible original identity, merely nostalgically romanticising or piggybacking on the visuals of those who came before them, such as obsessing over the aesthetics of the 1980s. They are like a ghost generation, with almost no stake in society at all, terminally online and living vicariously through those older than them, such as streamers. A trend that in the end is almost guaranteed to have such a generation inevitably embrace extreme ends of the political spectrum due to being so left behind in all the ways that actually matter. So whereas the boomers were rather libertarian, trending towards social liberalism and free market capitalism, one can expect the Zoomers to be the exact opposite, being rather authoritarian, trending towards being socially fascistic and economically communistic the exact opposite of the 1960s. Which brings us on to number two, racial unity versus racial division. It's no secret that the 1960s was the climax of the civil rights movement, a time when people started to turn their backs on things such as racial segregation and instead adopt a more colorblind approach, treating people not as members of their race, but simply as human beings. When the Beatles were asked to perform at a racially segregated concert in the American South, they simply refused to do so, something that was seen as extremely unusual for the time, but was in the spirit of such winds of change. Perhaps the extremely famous speech known as I Have a Dream, that speaks of men being created equal, people of different races being able to sit down together as brothers, and people being judged not by their skin but by their character, summarises the prevailing spirit of such beliefs of the time better than anything else. But while such beliefs may have started to prevail for a while, setting the status quo for the next few decades, ultimately it seems like such really was merely just a dream. As if we fast forward to the 2020s, today, race, far from being seen as something to be ignored, is starting to increasingly be seen as something of the utmost importance. Though rather than originating from conservatism and being blatantly hostile, such newfound racist movements now originate from progressivism, masquerading as revolving around social justice. Some people are told that they are inherently privileged for merely existing, regardless of their actual reality, while others are told that they can never amount to anything due to supposed biases against them, with companies and governments openly discriminating against people based on their race, with even actual racial segregation starting to make a return in places like college dorms. And as a result, by practically every metric, race relations have been plummeting for years. And similar to how the 1960s was seen as the birth of racial unity, the 2020s may well be seen by historians as the decade where such really started to turn into serious division again. With people becoming much more racially identitarian due to rising unresolved social issues, such as affirmative action, mass migration, double standards, media deception, and much, much more. It's clear that race, no matter who you are, is going to continue to play a massive and ever larger role in future political discourse. The exact opposite of the 1960s. Which brings us on to number three. Progressive counterculture versus conservative counterculture. In any society, you have the culture that rules the land and the counterculture that is trying to supplant it. And in the 1960s, conservatism was undoubtedly the culture and progressivism, the counterculture. All of the status quo back then were short herd suit wearers who read their Bibles and were good patriots to the nation. Whereas the rebels were the exact opposite long-haired, robe-wearing hippies who'd rather smoke a Bible than read it and thought patriotism was totally lame, man. And for a time, the former made the latter's lives very miserable indeed for daring to challenge the culture. Take a look into John Lennon's American visa issues as a prime example of such conduct in action. 
But fast forward to the 2020s, and the exact opposite proves true. As today, you have world leaders who wear pink Barbie hoodies, being religious is seen as rather uncouth if not outright embarrassing, and being a patriot in your nation is often seen as some form of political extremism. That is the new status quo, which means that, ironically, conservatism, because it failed to conserve anything, is now the counterculture. A fact that, when stated, absolutely infuriates the typical blue herd tattooed Antifa rioter who listens to metal music, as it reminds them of something that they know deep down already that they aren't really the rebel that they like to think they are. On the contrary, it's conservatives who are now much more likely to get fired, be censored, be imprisoned, take financial losses, or even be spied upon by intelligence agencies for their beliefs, even if you're at the top. To be a conservative today means to no longer sit on the throne, but to try and get it back. An underdog ideology that now increasingly resonates with the poorest and most downtrodden in society. Destined to, in the short term, suffer greatly, but perhaps in the long term could reap a series of unexpected victories due to being looked down on and underestimated far too much. The exact opposite of the 1960s. Which brings us on to number four. Free love versus marital love. With the 1960s came the introduction of the world's first contraceptive pill, and with it, a radical shift in how intercourse was perceived, quickly transforming in the lower classes from being a sacred act with sacred consequences to being a recreational act akin to drinking a can of Pepsi. The concept of free love started to reign supreme, especially among hippie circles with the idea being that traditional institutions such as marriage were now antiquated and no longer necessary, whereby everyone should simply be allowed to do as they so pleased in the name of raw hedonistic pleasure. Looking into the love lives of the Beatles would put the average elder of their day in a state of shock. Sadly, however, this societal concept would very quickly become the new normal over the next few decades, with, not too shockingly, absolutely horrendous consequences. Marriage rates fell, while divorce rates skyrocketed. Relations between men and women plummeted, while single-parent households went through the roof. And, perhaps worst of all, by far the most inhumane and unforgivable act that humanity has ever created, abortion, started to become normalised. Overall resulting in the Western world being perceived as by far the most sick culture on Earth when it came to romance and reproduction, with Western men growing an international reputation of acting like animals, and Western women being perceived as having no self-respect. However, fast forward to the 2020s, and the times seem to be changing. As the negative consequences for the free love doctrine start to become undeniable, there is now actually an increasing countercultural shift against establishment decadence that preaches the return to modesty, and it comes in many forms. Religiously, Orthodox, Judaic, Christian, and most prominently, Islamic rhetoric has started to come back in vogue harnessing many followers who even just a few years ago would never have given faith the time of day. But even outside of religion, you now have some newfound gendered corrections being peddled by popular influencers. Such as men shaming men for being passive and watching adult material, or women shaming women for not dressing modestly and giving themselves away. Even pronatalist policies to boost population growth, rather than relying on mass migration, are also starting to come to the forefront, being hailed by national governments and the richest man in the world. It's clear that individualistic hedonism has, for the first time in decades, started losing its appeal, while collectivistic family values are on the rise in tandem. And while one could be tempted to dismiss such as not more than a temporary reactionary fad, because such mindsets are factually far more healthy, and ultimately, required to have a functioning society, one can't see such disappearing again anytime soon. And the 2020s may well be seen as the decade when marital love slowly started to become celebrated again. The exact opposite of the 1960s. Which brings us on to number five. 
in touch warfare versus out of touch warfare. In the 1960s, the Vietnam War was a significantly controversial conflict in the United States, primarily because it involved many young men being drafted to fight and potentially die in a completely different country, in a completely different continent, for reasons that weren't exactly obvious to the average person. And thus, throughout the decade, right in the middle of the conflict, the anti-war movement became strongly interwined as part of the counterculture. With slogans such as Make Love Not War, Hell No We Won't Go, and John Lennon's famous Give Peace a Chance becoming extremely commonplace. The Vietnam War was seen as an unnecessary loss of life, not just for Americans, but for the Vietnamese too, that ultimately just wasn't worth it to get a bit ahead in the grand game of chess known as geopolitics. That, and it was also seen as a massive distraction from the numerous domestic issues that rapidly needed attention. But fast forward to the 2020s, and we have another overseas war. Not in Vietnam, but this time, Ukraine. While the USA got involved in Vietnam to prevent the USSR gaining influence via communism in the region, Ukraine is now focused upon in order to prevent Russia's invasion of the region. These wars are similar, as they are both overseas wars that demand intervention to prevent a much larger rival from gaining more global influence, but these wars are also extremely different in what such a response is. As while the US military is itching at the teeth to send troops to Ukraine, it simply wouldn't be wise to do so, because their rival in the region, Russia, has the world's largest stockpile of nuclear weapons. And as a result, rather than sending manpower in directly, the American military is instead limited to only sending in equipment for the Ukrainians to use themselves. But this has created an interesting phenomenon, as unlike with Vietnam, because the American public are not directly involved in the actual boots-on-the-ground combat, and basically have no possibility to ever be, they have become somewhat divorced from the actual consequences of war. And as a result, while there are some Americans, mostly conservative counterculturalists, who criticise American taxpayer dollars being spent on overseas wars rather than solving domestic issues, many Americans seem to not only support the continuation of the war, but even, dare I say, see it as some sort of show. Selfishly and cathartically making silly memes, or comparing world leaders to superheroes, similar behaviour to that of what a child would do. Imagine being a Ukrainian male who spends years fighting a war to defend his country, seeing his friends and family get needlessly slaughtered, only to come out at the end of it and see this. <coughs> and that really is the point here. Rather than rushing to get around the negotiating table, thousands of young men instead continue to be thrown in the meat grinder for very little gain. As well as the 1960s in the West was the start of questioning the nature of warfare because of how they affected the population, the 2020s in the West can be seen as the start of not questioning the nature of warfare because the population isn't directly affected regardless, which is, needless to say, an incredibly disturbing development. The exact opposite of the 1960s. Which brings us on lastly to number six. Optimism versus Pessimism It goes without saying that the 1960s, despite its flaws, was a time of immense optimism for the future. And really, who can blame them? World War II was long over, the economy was starting to boom, and numerous scientific breakthroughs were occurring, such as, of course, the space race. It was a refreshing time that was seen as a fresh slate, whereby people wanted to usher in a new age of experimentalism, such as, again, with the Beatles. I suppose you could say peace and love was a sort of universalist tone of the masses' subconscious during the time, as the general sentiment was that, yeah, the world wasn't perfect, but things were moving in the right direction, and in the end, everything will be alright. But fast forward to the 2020s, and this couldn't be any more different, as the general consensus now is not one of optimism, but pessimism. And really, who can blame us? World War III is constantly advertised as being around the corner, 
the economy is blatantly dying. And despite all the recent technological breakthroughs, we often find ourselves using such just to make up for the fact that our basic needs are no longer being met. Many people now live in states of mental dystopia, whereby immense sadness, anger, paranoia, etc. are all too commonplace. With the overarching idea that the world is constantly moving in the wrong direction, being absolutely paramount and almost universally agreed upon. If peace and love was the tone of the 1960s, then war and hate is definitely the tone of the 2020s. The exact opposite of the 1960s. Nevertheless, Your Honour, I present my case. A youth surplus to an elder surplus, racial unity to racial division, a progressive counterculture to a conservative counterculture, free love to marital love, in-touch warfare to out-of-touch warfare, and optimism to pessimism. The same events, but in reverse. A musician called Carlos Santana once said that the 60s were a leap in human consciousness. The music was like Dali, with many colours and revolutionary ways. The youth of today must go there to find themselves. And I agree completely. I firmly believe that music, much more so than books or even videos, is the closest thing we have to a time machine. As by listening to these tunes from the 1960s, I was getting a glimpse into the general popularised psyche of the time. Not merely just as an observer, but as a direct experiencer. And that's when I realised. The reason these tunes enchanted me so much is because what they represented was almost completely anathema to my actual current time in the 2020s within the general Western cultural sphere of North America, Western Europe, and Oceania. And if this truly is the case, then the 2020s may well also be seen as a transformative decade that subsequently stands out in setting the scene for the rest that shall follow it, just as the 1960s did. And perhaps this really shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. The progressive revolution of the 1960s did, after all, spawn from the failures of the Christian conservative status quo to address the concerns of the time, leading them to be replaced accordingly. But likewise, the very same progressives who are the status quo now are also clearly failing to live up to such a mantle, and thus, there's almost no reason why they too shouldn't suffer a similar fate. Thus, we must ask, is the time of unquestioned progressivism coming to an end, and are the winds of change now moving, not just towards the right, but the far right? Out of curiosity, I did a poll, without proper context, to ask if people had noticed a slow but steady shift in this regard. Of which, 79% of people said that they had indeed noticed, with just 21% saying that they had not. A sizeable majority. But I suppose that, in the end, only time will tell. But to me personally, this decade, and perhaps the next few to come, seem to be resembling a very predictable pattern. Of which, if you've been paying attention, you already really know how it's all going to end. It's truly just all so tiresome. <laughs>